It is indeed good to be here on Sabbath after a week of rain, isn't it? And uh, many prayers for rain, and many prayers also in, uh, in our Sabbath school classes this morning, thanking God for the rain. It was awesome to hear our children have that as their focal point for many of their prayers today. So we're, very, we're thankful to God for what he's done for us. If I was to use the acronym GOAT, G-O-A-T, this is for you young people, GOAT. I don't think any of our more mature generation would know what that acronym stands for, but what, what does that acronym stand for? Just yell it out. What was that one? Tom Brady. Tom Brady. You know, Pastor Allen's here, he asked me to preach and he's actually critiquing me here at the moment, so I'm a bit nervous. I've, I've had to divert to him straight up. All right, Tom Brady. Greatest of all time. Football player. Ah, football player. You're right. I heard it. Greatest of all time. G, greatest O of A, all T time. So Tom Brady, NFL player. Okay. So in Australia, you know, we've got, it's, it's mainly to do with sporting things. So uh, in Australia, we've got cricket. Love cricket. Uh, Nathan Lyon, he's an off spinner. He's been referred to as the greatest off spinner of all time. If you're an international soccer fan like uh, Asher, the greatest soccer player of all time, he'd probably say is uh, Lionel Messi, I think, at the moment. That's what they're saying. Don't know if you've ever heard of him. Uh, what about when it comes to rugby league? Don. Don might say Cameron Smith. Jonathan Thurston, and there's not always agreement about who the greatest of all time is. You think about um, basketball. When I was a lot younger, uh, there was a basketballer by the name of Michael Jordan. But there's dispute because there's another basketballer now by the name of LeBron James, still playing, and they're still saying, well, he could be the greatest of all time. And so we will never know until he retires. What if I was to refer to the greatest king of Judah or Israel of all time? Who would be the greatest king in your mind? What if I was to switch, though, the G from greatest to godliest? Who in your mind would be the godliest king of all time when it came to the nations of Israel and Judah? Now, if you're not sure about kings of Israel and Judah, there was Saul, David, and Solomon. And they were kings over Israel. And then the nation split. And you had Judah in the south. You have Israel in the north, and each of those kingdoms had 20 kings. So there were 43 kings in total. 43 kings in total. Who would be the godliest of all time? Well, the Bible does say this, and I'm going to read to you a verse that makes reference to the godliest of all time and the lesson for us. This is found in 2 Kings. I'm not going to tell you where it is, so you're not going to look it up just yet. And I've blotted out the name, but it says here, Neither before nor after him was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength, in accordance with all of the law of Moses. Who is this king? Before we get there, I hear a name, but before we get there, let's rate him. Let's say, let's give him a thumbs up. This guy is the greatest king of all time. So we're going to give him a thumbs up. Okay? And there are many kings that are in between. So a thumbs down for perhaps the most evil, one of the most evil. Who, let's, let's see it. Um, Ahab. How would you rate him? You'd probably rate him a thumbs down. Okay. Uh, Manasseh. Yeah, definitely a thumbs down. Okay. What about Hezekiah? Where would you rate him in that? Look, Hezekiah was okay. He started off all right. He drifted a little bit and he came back to God. I'd probably give him maybe like this, that sort of a thumbs up. Okay. What about Solomon? He started off good. Where would your rating be? Probably halfway, or a little bit over halfway, Mikey says. Okay, I'd agree with you. Okay. What about David? How would you rate David? A man after God's own heart. Would you rate him that way? Slightly off. Pam, Pam's giving him a thumbs up. Most people go, oh, Eunice is brave. She's saying half, half. Look, he's probably not quite there. Okay. Well, turn with me to 2 Kings 23, verse 25. The greatest king... The godliest king, I should say. Correct myself. The godliest king of all time. 2 Kings 23, 25. Now, interestingly, some Bibles actually don't mention his name in this verse, but most Bibles do. 2 Kings 23, verse 25 says this. Neither before nor after Josiah. 
was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his strength in accordance with all of the law of Moses. There were other great kings. David and Hezekiah were perhaps greater kings, but there was no more godlier king than the boy Josiah. No more godlier king. And what, you make, what made Josiah even more unique was how godly he was in his time because it was an extremely evil nation as we're about to find out. David was a greater man but Josiah was a godlier man. So the question is what can we learn from Josiah? Well there is a lesson here from everyone from age 8 up to 80. Every individual in this church there's a lesson for each one of us from the story of Josiah and we're going to get into that. How do we become the godliest of our time? So let's make no mistake, Josiah lived in evil times. It was not an easy era to be a king, let alone to be a godly king. If you look at Josiah's father, Ammon, and his grandfather, Manasseh, they were the two of the most evil kings of Judah of all time. Manasseh would sacrifice children to other gods. Ammon was king for two years before he was assassinated by his own advisors. That's how evil he was. They realized it. They killed him. And so Josiah becomes king at eight years of age. When you think about life today, life here on this earth is not much different to what life was like for the young Josiah. We are living in a broken world, in a broken world. And it saddens all of us to see the destruction of our communities, of families, of individuals. You think about it, parents, make no mistake, you are bringing your child up into a broken world. And young people, teenagers, Youth, life is not going to get any easier in this broken world. Each year, at the beginning of each year, everyone says, I'm hoping that this next year will be better than the last. But the reality is, in this broken world, it is not going to happen. Life will not get better. Life will not get easier. The challenges that get thrown up at us by the devil will only continue to increase. You're delusional to think that life will get better as the years go on. And in the case of Judah, the nation of Judah, this nation teetered on the brink of, of, of exile. In fact, after Josiah passed away and died, it wasn't soon after that that the Babylonians came in and they were sent to exile. That because, as part of God's punishment for years of neglect. And their evil ways and their neglect for God was brought about primarily due to their lack of attention and understanding of God's word. They neglected God's word and his law. So, turn with me to 2 Chronicles 34. 2 Chronicles 34. Now, if you're not aware about how the Bible works when it comes to the kings of Israel and Judah, you can read the story of all of the kings of Israel and Judah in the books of 1 and 2 Kings and the books of 1 and 2 Chronicles. Slightly different perspective, but the same kings. So we're going to flip between Chronicles and Kings. And the first part I'd like you to look at is 2 Chronicles 34, verse 14 to 18. Keeping in mind what we're looking at in this verse is the lack of understanding and attention that people have to God's word, the nation of Judah. 34, verse 14 to 18 reads this. While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, the, pri the priest Hilkiah found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Hilkiah said to the secretary, Shaphan, I found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and Shaphan brought the book to the king, brought it to Josiah. Skip down to verse 18 for me. The secretary Shaphan then informed the king, the priest Hilkiah has given me a book, and Shaphan read it to the king. The year is 622 BC, it's the 18th year of Josiah's reign. He's 26 years of age. I think, Mikey, how old are you? You just had a birthday. 23, not quite Mikey's age. Anyway, 26 here. And Josiah has commanded that the temple be restored and rebuilt. And so he's bringing the money. The money that was given to the temple for its restoration, he said, bring it to the temple because what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay the laborers. I'm going to pay the brickies, the tradies, the candlestick makers, those that are sewing the curtains and we're going to start this renovation. 
And as they're preparing for this renovation, they're removing all of the rubbish that had accumulated in the temple over the years. Things that shouldn't have been in there. And as they're cleaning out the temple, they find the Torah. The first five books of our Bible today. The books of Moses, given to Moses by God. It's amazing what you do, what you find when you have a spring clean, isn't it? When you're moving or when you're renovating. My parents recently moved. They moved from the house they were living in uh, to a little granny flat on my sister's property. And they'd only been in this house for 15 years. But it's amazing what you can accumulate in 15 years. And so they were sifting through things for months, knowing that they were going to move. Uh, things they were going to throw away, and of course it's very hard to throw things away, so that pile was fairly small. Uh, they were sifting through things they were going to donate and give away, and they were sifting things they were going to take, and that pile was fairly large. And as they were sifting through the things uh, in their possession, they come across this. My first real Bible, and I say real because I had a storybook Bible, it's most kids, but my first real Bible, and the year is 1984 inscribed in here. I said that in class and, uh, to, the, to the teens today and they have no idea what that number is. <laughs> Half of our youth don't either. 1984, nearly 40 years old, seen better days, but my very first Bible given to me by my parents. Well, the Torah that was found in the temple was over a thousand years old and had been hidden away for not 40 years but hundreds of years hundreds of years no one had referred to its teachings the covenant between God and his people had been forgotten God's instructions for life had been forgotten had been neglected you see the the people of the Israelites those in Judah the nation they had actually forsaken God partially because they actually never made reference, never looked at God's word and his law. It's like trying to go on holiday down the south coast at the moment. Let's say you have no hard copy map. Let's say you don't bring Google Maps with you because you want to leave your phone at home because you're going on holidays, you don't want to be contacted by anyone, and you're driving to a new holiday destination down the south coast. You're not sure where that destination is. And as you're going down the south coast, you realise there's been bushfires and signs have been destroyed and burnt. The likelihood of you getting to your destination in an efficient manner, in a timely manner to enjoy your holiday is not very likely without some sort of map, some sort of road map, some sort of signs to get you there. And that is exactly what happened to Judah. They had drifted away from God and somewhat unknowingly because the Bible wasn't there or the Torah wasn't there for their, to enable them to evaluate and confront their behavior to understand what God required of them and so they drifted into the thoroughly pagan ways of their neighbors and the sad thing is the Torah was actually in the temple the whole time it had survived many evil and wicked kings it was not destroyed it was there but the words of the Torah had not made it into their hearts had not made it into their hearts you look at our church there's a pile of Bibles sitting there every Christian Adventist home probably has more than one Bible but have the words of that most precious book gone off the shelf and into our hearts as our guidebook for life. Let me say it again. If we do not read and if we do not understand the Bible, we have no basis from which to evaluate or confront our behaviour, to guide our behaviour. The Bible does serve as our guidebook for life because within these pages of this book, as the answers the principles for every question in life. And there was nothing more pleasing for me today in our Sabbath school class. We were reading about the armour of God and our teens brought out their Bibles. Almost every one of them. And we were fortunate to be able to give one of our teens a Bible today. Elisa got his Bible today. And as we were going through reading about the armor of God we're going around and I'm uh, allocating some of the teens to read I jump in and read a verse and I've never been more happy to be disturbed whilst I'm reading the Bible than when young Sia says can I read to see our young people engage with the Bible want to read the Bible makes makes me so happy as, he, as, as one of the leaders within our church because that's what we want. We must be engaging with the Bible. Because if we're not, then we have no road map 
for life. 2 Chronicles 34 verse 19, let's go down to verse 19, it says this, When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. He didn't tear his clothes because he didn't like his outfit. He didn't tear his clothes because it wasn't suitable for the day or he was hot. Tearing your clothes in ancient times was a powerful expression of grief, public expression of grief. He was devastated. Josiah was devastated. Because if you look in 2 Chronicles 34.3, it'll show you the reason. It indicates the reason why he was devastated. Remember, he's 26 years of age at this point. 2 Chronicles 34, verse 3 says this for in the eighth year of his reign while he was still a boy he began to seek the god of his ancestor david at age eight sorry in the eighth year of his reign at age 16 he started searching for god he's 26 now he's searching for god from 16. who here is 16 who is 13 12. Just like Josiah, the time to start searching for God is now. He's saying at, at, age, at age 16, who is God? What does he require of me? How do I follow him? What is the right way to follow him? Yet, faithfully ser searching and seeking for God for 10 years, God suddenly reveals what he requires of Josiah 10 years later when they discover the books of the law. And sometimes we get so caught up as young people about needing to know the answers now, understanding what God requires of us now, understanding what, he, what we're reading. It's not easy sometimes, but what God says is just faithfully follow me, faithfully seek me, even if it takes a decade before you understand what I require of you, but start now. And young people, teenagers, those of you that put your hand up when I said you're in your teens, what are you searching for? What are you searching for? Are you looking for things that will give you earthly satisfaction, earthly joy, very limited? Or are you searching for things with earth, heavenly consequences and heavenly reward? How hungry are you to develop that relationship with God, Jesus, the one that gave his life for you? And don't get consumed about having to know all the answers. Josiah didn't know all the answers. But what he said, what, what, what we can guarantee from the Bible is that if we seek God, if we actually go out there and search for him from that young age of 16, or if you're only 13 or 12 now, you will find God for a prophet around those same times. This is one, what, one, what Jeremiah says. When you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all of your heart. Jeremiah was a prophet around those times. He says, you look for God, you will find him. You might not find him today, you might not understand fully today, but you will find him and you will understand and God will reveal himself to you. And the time for you teenagers to seek God is now. Don't wait till you finish your HSC. Don't wait till you get your next boyfriend or girlfriend. Don't wait till you have 10,000 followers on Instagram. Don't wait till you get your license. Don't wait until you graduate from university, don't wait till you get your first job, don't wait till you leave home, don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. Start now. Like Josiah, grab that opportunity to ask that question, who is Jesus? What does he want from me? What does he require of me? How do I follow him? And even Solomon, who wasn't the godliest of all kings, but one of the smartest, he actually says this, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 1 says that. Remember your creator. Start now. Start now. And the beautiful thing is you will find God, young people. Teenagers, you will find God. But what you do when you find God and when he reveals himself to you is so important. Because unless we change our ways and commit to changing our ways, then it's not good enough. It's going to get us nowhere. If we simply hear the words of this story and read and say great story of Josiah a great young man became king at eight turned to God was the godliest of all kings but we don't change our ways and commit to God then we've wasted our time see Josiah he hears the words of the law he's devastated he tears his clothes and he tears his clothes because he realizes where he is at right now is not quite where God wants him to be but even more so the nation of Judah where they're at right now, even though he was bringing the people back to God, they weren't quite where God wanted them to be. Make no mistake, the 30 years that Josiah reigned, or 31 years, it, 
Judah was a godly nation. Moved from an evil nation to a godly nation, the nation that God wanted them to be. And so, at age 26, he holds the greatest Passover celebration the nation has ever seen since the days of Samuel. The Bible says it in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 35, 18. We won't go there, but he holds this massive celebration. Remember the Passover was a remembrance for what God had done for his people Israel. When he took them out of Egypt, brought them to the promised land, saying, I'm going to make you a mighty nation. I'm going to fulfill my promise to Abraham. You are going to be my people. And we've got an agreement. You follow me and this is who we're going to be. And Josiah realises this. He says, we need to celebrate the goodness of God. What God has done for us. Because when we don't celebrate God's goodness, when we don't recognise how great He is, when we don't spend time thanking Him for the many things He's done for us, we are at risk of forgetting who He is and drifting into the evil ways of our nation. And the story of Josiah is a perfect example of how a young person can change lives. Josiah couldn't change the outcome. The nation of Judah still went into exile, but for 30 years they were a godly nation. He changed the lives of many individuals as they turned to God. And young people of our church today, could it be that God is asking you to take a stand for Him in your families, in your schools, in the places that you work, in your universities? Could it be that He's saying, seek me and you will find me and then make a stand for me? And you, could you, perhaps, influence one life for Him? Have a hand in saving one life for the kingdom by taking a stand for Jesus, just as Josiah did at that young age. I've spoken to the young people, but now there's a message here for us as parents and carers and grandparents, anyone that has anything to do with children. And I'm going to ask you to turn to 2 Kings 22 verse 1. 2 Kings 22 verse 1. If you're in a position to influence any of our children in this church or outside of this church, this is for you. This is for me. 2 Kings 22 verse 1 says this. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidah, daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. Women are rarely mentioned in the Bible by name. Only influential women are. There are some that are poor influences, majority are good. But here we have Josiah's mother mentioned by name, Jedidah. Jedidah, the wife and queen of one of the most evil kings of Judah, was a godly woman. Her name, in fact, means the darling of Jehovah. The darling of Jehovah. God's darling. And immediately after her name's mentioned, if you go to verse 2, it says this, He did, Josiah did, what was right in the sight of the Lord. Her name's mentioned, and then the next mention is, Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Josiah was a godly man, the godliest king of Judah, because his mother set him on the right path when he was a child. She would have recognised and cringed at the evil ways of her husband and her father-in-law. And every day she's fervently working in the background to teach Josiah about God's way, what God requires, of how to, how to obey God's commands and how to live that godly life. I am forever grateful to my parents that they spent much time talking to my brother, my sister and I about Jesus. They chose to give each one of us a Bible at a very early age and to immerse us in the Bible on a daily basis. And I never realised it back then, how important it was. At a very young age, they chose to immerse us in God's Word. And they had very little possessions. They were both migrants that came to Australia, escaping persecution in their various countries. Yet they chose to spend their hard-earned money sending us to a Christian school. And each evening in our home, we would open the Bible 
and talk about the goodness of God. I may not inherit um, many things from my worldly parents, from my parents, many worldly things from my parents. Uh, they don't have much, but their commitment to raising godly children is the greatest legacy that any parent can give their child. For in the words of Jesus himself, Mark 8.36, it says this, For what will it profit them to gain the whole world but lose their soul? As parents, are we raising godly children? Or are we worried about giving them everything in life? Every possession, our inheritance, a great education that we forget to teach them about Jesus and what he's done for us, the goodness of God. And the story of the kings of Israel and Judah is a wake-up call to each and every parent here. Because you can be the wealthiest, you can be the most powerful individual on the planet. But it counts for nothing unless you live for the Lord. And Jedidah knew that very well. From the most evil generation in the history of Judah rises one boy. <laughs> From the home of the two of the most evil kings of Judah rises the most godly king ever seen, ever written about. And like the days of Josiah, our world is broken, like I've said. Greed, infidelity, child abuse, fraud, natural disasters, and the rest of the horrors the devil wants to throw at us. But like so many stories in this great book, Josiah is a message of hope for each one of us, as children, as teenagers, as young people, as parents. Because is it possible that we, as parents and grandparents, that we would prioritise heavenly matters above earthly success? when it comes to raising our children? Is it possible that we could actually raise the godliest of children of our time? Not the greatest, but the godliest of our generation. And they would take this message to the rest of the world, to this broken world, to com finish the commission that's been given to us by Jesus. Or could it be that you as young people, you teens and young people here in our church, that you would actually seek God and you would actually find Him when you search for Him. And that you will change lives, not the course of this nation, it's broken, but the course of one life today. Perhaps a family member, perhaps a friend, perhaps someone you haven't even met just yet. But could it be that you could do that? I believe it could be. Because God is calling each one of us to be the godliest of our time. The godliest here in the end of time. And the only question left to answer is, like Josiah, will we accept his call?